I've been telling you all month, we're not crazy here. But we get excited, amen? We get excited about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, if you will, and uh, how important He is for our life. It's not a weird, strange, goofy thing. It's, it's a natural part of who God created us to be. And so I just want to encourage you again, we're going to finish this up this, this morning in our, our monthly uh, series on the Holy Spirit. And I just want you to open your heart to receive all that God has for you. Uh, he's not goofy, weird, spooky, but he's important. He's necessary. He's that power for life. And then also I wanted to see uh, Pastor Cody, see if he could rock a little bit, right? Come on, need a little 80s vibe there. My little, can't really fling his hair or anything, but he, back in the day, how many of you remember back in the day, Pastor Cody had dreads? <laughs> he had dreads. Yeah. Can you believe that? That's all right. And I, by the way, I always want to say, I didn't make him cut those. I didn't. After he cut them, everybody got mad. I thought, did you make Cody cut those hair dreads? No. Holy Spirit did. <laughs> hey, God's good and he's faithful. Amen. Welcome everybody this morning. We're so glad you're here with us. Appreciate everybody joining us online as well. As I said earlier, we are wrapping up a series on the Holy Spirit. Help us on the way. You know, and that's really the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to be our helper while we were on the planet. And so I don't want to do a lot in the way of review, but I do want to tell you this morning, I have a lot of information. I really want to get you the, the word, out scripture on everything. Don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. Uh, it is a topic that can be, uh, if I could use the words, I don't know if controversial is the right word, but it seems to be that. Uh, misunderstood, maybe be a, a better word. Misrepresented, abused, used. People in my profession have used it, abused it to make themselves like super spiritual Christians and everybody else second class or Others don't believe in it, and they look at people that do as wild fanatics and out of touch with reality and all that. And I just want to just give you the word this morning. I want you to open your hearts to receive. So the live notes will have a lot of information that you'll need and want on that to go through uh, with us today. Uh, so if you haven't downloaded that, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, let's jump right in for time's sake. John 14, 16, here is our foundational scripture. This is where we started um, uh, at the beginning of the month and uh, where we get the phrase helper, the word helper from. Uh, because ultimately, I want you to get, that's, that's why the Holy Spirit is active on the earth today. Uh, he is to be our helper. It says this, uh, starting in verse 16, it says, I will pray the Father. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I'll pray, the word being translated, ask. I'll ask the Father, Father God, and he will give you another helper, implying he's just like me. He's another one of me. We know that the Trinity, we'll see that in a minute. The Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. He's going to give you another just like me that he may abide with you forever. He's going to be with you forever on the earth and in heaven. I'm going to ascend, Jesus would say this, I'm going to ascend to heaven and be seated at the right hand of the Father, but the helper will be active with you on the earth. Uh, the spirit of truth is who he is, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells in you, with you, and will be in you. Uh, I'll not leave you orphans. I'll come to you. You'll not ever, ever be alone because of the helper or the Holy Spirit. Now, depending on your translation, you might see the word comforter. You might see the word advocate there, and those are great words. We understand comforter, advocate is the one who comes alongside. I do want to say this in uh, light of review, if you will. If you hadn't been here for the series, please go back all the way to the beginning of the month and look at those. But we're talking about the Holy Spirit. He is God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, I use this illustration. Um, all three of those are expressions of God, three in one. Uh, I am this morning, right now, operating as a pastor. I am, my wife is here. I am a husband. My daughter's in the coffee shop. My other one's at work. I am a father, but I'm all done. Don, 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 I'm three in one. Right now I'm operating, the expression I'm operating in as pastor, if my wife needed me, I would go to her and I would operate as husband, but, but pastor and father would come with me. If my daughter needed me, I love you, I would walk off this stage, I would go back to her, either one, and I would operate as father, but husband and pastor would still go with me. Are you getting the picture here? That's the Trinity, that's how God works, he's three in one. Now. Let's remember also three expressions actively working. The first expression, God the Father, he created heaven and earth. He created everything that we would need. He created a plan and purpose for your life. And then when sin came in and man fell, he created a plan for you to get out. He provided a savior. But then Jesus said, teaching his disciples how to pray, he said, let's pray this way, our Father who art in heaven. God is a holy God separated from a sinful world because he's holy. He cannot engage in a sinful environment, but yet he loved you and I so much, he sent the expression of him that could, and that was Jesus the Savior. Jesus came to the earth to redeem mankind 
so a sinful man can now have access to a heavenly holy father who is up in heaven. And when Jesus finished his work, the Bible says he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the father. But when he left, and you'll see in the scripture, he sent another, John 14, he sent another helper to be with us. So let me say this, the Holy Spirit is the part of God that is active on the earth today. And so I don't know that we can understand that in our brain. Well, I'm praying to God and, and God's responding. He is through the God, the part of him that's the Holy Spirit. We'll ask Jesus to come help me, lead me and guide me. And Jesus is leading me and guide me. He is, but through the Holy Spirit. That's the part that does that. And so I just wanted you to get that. Kind of set that up the first two weeks. So today, let's take this a step further. Acts 19, verses one through three. Here's what the Bible says. While Apollos was at Corinth, see what happened was, uh, this is 30 or 40 years after the disciples were gathered, Jesus said, go to Jerusalem, wait for me, and for the promise of the Father, you will be empowered with power from on high. And so this happened. They, they got together, the Holy Spirit fell, we'll look at that in a minute, and fire and power to be witnesses. This is 30 or 40 years after the Holy Spirit came on the earth and power. And now they're out planting churches. They're planting churches all over. Most of this, what you'll see, is planted in modern day Turkey and there's all these churches popping up on coastal towns. So now the church has been empowered. The outpouring of the spirit was the empowerment of the church. Now the church is going out to do what the church is to do, reach people. Now they have the power of the Holy Spirit to do the great commission, going to all the world, amen. So the Holy Spirit came to empower them to do the job. And so now they're doing it and they come upon a group of believers here. They're out planting churches. Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples, followers. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit, which today I would dare say probably many of you would say that today. I've not heard there's a Holy Spirit. Maybe your church didn't teach on that. Maybe you've not been in church. But I think today that still holds true. And they answered, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive implying there's more than one baptism? John's baptism, they replied. John's baptism, they replied. And so again, now we see the Holy Spirit being brought into this conversation. Did you re receive the Holy Spirit when you believed a salvation experience? Did you receive the Holy Spirit after that? We didn't know there is one. What baptism then did you receive? Obviously, then there's more than one baptism. Are you with me right now this morning? Okay. And so there's a couple of baptisms I wanna to explain to you this morning that will help you understand how we receive and walk in the person and power of the Holy Spirit. So we see in Acts 9, one through three, we see that there are more than one baptism. And baptism means to be immersed. I'm just I'm gonna give you a lot of teaching today. Baptism means to be immersed. Uh, it'd be saturated maybe. It's not just a, a sprinkling. It's not just a, a splattering or whatever. It is immersed, saturated, submerged if you will. In scripture, it is not always in water. There is an immersion, a saturation in more than just water in the scripture. It means to immerse. Three baptisms actually you'll see in the Bible and they're all for you and they all stand on their own as separate experiences. And the first one is salvation, which you say, now I don't know that I call salvation baptism, but it literally is and it's baptized into the body of Christ. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are baptized or immersed into the body of Christ. When you see the body of Christ, we understand that to be through the work of Jesus and then to the body of believers that we would call Christians or the Christian's church, if you will. Baptized in the body of Christ. And so when you see the word saved there, you get baptized with Christ or in his body. And that's for believers. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says this, for we are all baptized. Now listen, we're all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. We're baptized when we're saved. This is interesting. When we're saved, we're baptized into the body of Christ. But who does the baptizing into the body of Christ at salvation? One capital S spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Come on, it's that part of God that baptizes you into the family of God or the work of Jesus. They're all working together. I hope you see they're all three expressions are working together. In fact, the Bible says that you don't come to Jesus unless the Holy Spirit draws you. Well, that was just a great sermon you preached. Thank you for that, but <laughs> it was the Holy Spirit. No, it was this service or this moment. No, it's the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, that brings you into Christ or into the body of Christ. And so uh, what we see here is a salvation experience. When you get saved, you get baptized into the body of Christ. Galatians 3, 26 through 27 
So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself, put on Christ, you've been immersed in Christ into his family by faith. It said that in verse 26. For you're baptized into Christ, so you're immersed into the family through salvation. John 20, 19 through 22. Let's take a look at this one. This one's an interesting passage because it literally shows us the very first salvation experience in Scripture. And it happens to the disciples, rightly so, those that were walking with Jesus. After Jesus is resurrected, he's gone to the cross. He's paid for sin. He's gone to the grave. He rose again in resurrection power. Now he's walking the earth. He's just started doing that. And all of a sudden, he pops in on the disciples. Here's what it says in John 20, 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, interesting note, they were all afraid. Jesus was just crucified. And now they're afraid for their own lives for fear of the Jew, Jewish leaders and Jesus came and stood among them. He just popped through the locked door. He just popped through and said, peace, be still. And after he had said this, he showed the hands and side, the holes in his hands, the spear hole in his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when now all of a sudden they realized this really is Jesus. And he pops in and just surprises them and shows them who he is. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. Now they're super, at first they were afraid. Oh, no, no, peace, calm down a second. And now they're super excited. It is you. We see the holes in your hands and your side. And he says, okay, calm down. We got to talk for a minute. And he says, as the Father has sent me, listen to this, I'm sending you. I'm giving you a mission. I'm giving you a job. And he goes on to say this then in verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it wasn't that moment that he just went, ah, right? Like, like, okay, come on. You've been dead three days, right? <laughs> and so and what he did, that's that word pneuma. Breathe is a word pneuma that you see in the creation story. I think uh, Pastor Eric mentioned that earlier when he was up here in the creation story, where it literally means a creative force, the breath of God, a creative force. And at that moment, they were saved. How could they be saved? Now, come on, they've been walking with Jesus for three years. The only way that they could be saved is if Jesus went to the cross to pay for the sin, went to hell, and then resurrected in resurrection power. Now, people can have a salvation experience because sin had been paid for. Now, you get that, right? Sin had been paid for. That's the only way that could have happened. So now, Jesus breathes a breath, creative force, the breath of God in their life, and they're saved. And now, he gives them some instructions. So when you look over in Luke 24, 49, this is the same story in Luke that we just read. If you wanna read, go back and read the whole story again. In Luke, you can start with verse 36. But for time's sake, I'm coming to the end of the story. Same story that we just saw when Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit on them and they were saved. And let me say this, because some people don't understand this. When you are saved and you have a salvation experience, you receive the Holy Spirit. And some people will say, no, not until you speak in tongues or whatever that is. You know, you're, not, you're not spirit. You don't have the spirit in you. Well, that's not true. And that's just false doctrine. And that's how everything gets all screwed up and turns people off. That's not true. When you become born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. But that's not all there is to him. There's another working. So we see now that they have the Holy Spirit has come inside of them. And he gave them a job. He says, I was doing this. And now I'm sending you to do this. For I'm going to send what... I'm gonna send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Keep that scripture up there for a second. I need now to empower you for the job. Because I walked in a power, I'm 100% God, but 100% man, but I walked in a power greater than my own. You're gonna to need to do this job on the earth, and I'm sending you, for which the father sent me now, to reach the lost, to change lives. I'm gonna need now to make sure that you have the power necessary to do that, because your natural power is not enough. And so he says, so go wait for the promise. He talked many times about the Father sending a promise to them and stay in the city until you have been, what's that word? Clothed, immersed. You've already been saved. The Holy Spirit's been come in you, but now something's gonna come on you. Clothed, and what's that gonna be? Power. Why do we need that kind of power? To live life victoriously and to win the world for Jesus, to change lives, because you don't have enough natural power and ability to make the impact God wants or designed you to make on this planet, so he knew he needed to give you another. You needed to have that power from on high. After you're born again, you can receive the power from on high. Uh, Acts 1, verse three through five, same story. Luke is the author of Acts. He just wrote his book, we read a little bit out of it, and he's also wrote in the book, written the book of Acts. 
continuation of the same story. After his suffering, he presented himself to them. Remember, he popped through the door when they were behind a locked door and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Look at the holes in my hand. Look at the hole in my side. And it goes on to say this, that he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Here's your mission. And on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift, gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. Told you many times. For John baptized with water, we'll get to that in a minute, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll be baptized, immersed, clothed, another working of the Holy Spirit. You need to see that there's more than one baptism. Some people think you get all you need when you get saved. And that's not necessarily the case because we see many times, we'll see it further and further on. There's a, a clothing and empowering of the Holy Spirit after salvation. Now let me say this. The only, sal- the only baptism you need to get to heaven is salvation. I would have thought maybe a bigger response. Amen, that's right, Pastor. I'm saved to go to heaven, right? <laughs> The only, salva- the only baptism you need to get to heaven is salvation. Now, I'm gonna be very clear when I say this. There is a, a, a teaching of that you have to be water bi- baptized to get to heaven. I don't believe that to be true. In fact, I, we teach it all the time. I taught it before, and I had somebody write me a little note on an offering envelope, and they said, how dare you tell everybody that they don't have to be water baptized to get to heaven? And I said, the Bible dares me. <laughs> because they're separate works. The most important one is salvation. So if you don't agree with anything I say from this point forward, hey, I get it. That's for you to wrestle with. I hope that you listen to the Holy Spirit and see the word and then you make your decision. But listen, the most important thing is winning people for Christ and getting as many people to heaven as we possibly can. Amen? Amen? So we can differ on the other two baptisms, water baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't need those to get to heaven. The only thing you need is salvation. And we'll talk about why that's important to have that a standalone work. So it's important for us to understand it and see the different baptism. Water baptism is important for you and I to have. So that's the second baptism, water baptism. It's a separate experience from salvation, and it needs to be. If you had to get water, let me say, okay, if you had to get water baptized to get to heaven, then it would be in your own works. It'd be in your own works. How'd you get to heaven? I just went down, I knew I needed to get water baptized, and on my own I went and got baptized, and now I can go to heaven. No, you can't. It's a free gift. It's given to everybody by Jesus that man cannot boast on his own, but it's only by the gift, grace through faith, amen, by the gift of Jesus. So you can't lump them two together because then you would have worked your way to heaven and you can't do that. You have to receive the free gift of what Jesus did. And so it's a separate working. And so water baptism is separate, but it's important. And so uh, water baptism does not save you. It declares that you've been saved. And we talk about it quite a bit. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on that one this morning. It is a separate baptism. Matthew 28, 19 says this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That's the first baptism in the, in the family of, of God, the body of Christ. And then the second baptism, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There is even debate on what you're supposed to say when you baptize people, water baptize people. <laughs> as if like you could say the wrong words and they'll go to hell, right? It's, like, it's, not, it's not that way. So it's not a, baptism doesn't, water baptism doesn't get you into heaven, salvation does. And so, but the second baptism is, it is important as well. It is important to do a public expression outwardly of an inward working. And the Bible's very clear about that. Again, I don't wanna spend time on it because we teach on it. A third baptism, it's a separate baptism, different than the first two, and it's baptism in the Holy Spirit, a separate experience. You have the Holy Spirit if you've been saved. We already saw that, but there's an immersing. That, like, is, let me say it this way. In this cup, there is water. It's when this cup got saved, <laughs> the, the water came to live inside till, till I drink it. And... Uh, And then if I was then to take this cup with water in it and put it in a swimming pool with water, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I have Jesus or through the Holy Spirit in me and then I can be saturated, immersed in the presence and power through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's another working there. And just hang with me because we'll clear it up, continue to clear it up as we go. You have the Holy Spirit when you're saved but there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so this is where it gets a little confusing. People have been taught all kinds of things about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or not taught at all. And, it's, and it gets packaged with some crazy, weird, goofy stuff. And I just wish it wouldn't, because it has turned so many people off of a wonderful experience that God intended for everyone to have. 
And here's what I believe, the devil has done a masterful job of making it look goofy, weird, abusive, all this kind of stuff so people will not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and walk in the power that God intended for you and I. Because if he can't keep you from getting saved and going to heaven, he sure wants to keep you from walking in the power of God and save, getting other people saved and going to heaven. And so it's the packaging. It's been packaged, and I don't agree with the packaging a lot of what I've seen. I don't see it in scripture, and so people will stick with the first baptism in Christ, and maybe the second one, water baptism, but I don't really need that last one. And can I say it this way? You may not feel like you need that last one, and you don't to get to heaven, but you do to live the life God empowered and intended you to live. You really do to live what, how God wants you to live here on the earth. Remember, he's given us a job. He gave us a job to do, and you need it to do the job. All you need to get to heaven is the first one, but there's a wonderful benefit of this third one, just like the second one. And let me say this right here. He wants you to have all three. He wants you to have all three. And in October 10th, I believe, October 10th, we have a water baptism plan. And so if you have not experienced the second one yet, I want you to go ahead and get signed up and get registered for that one. And I believe then this morning we can take care of the third one. You don't have to have the second and third one in any proper order there, you know? But it all has to happen after the first one. Right? After that, you can have Holy Spirit and then get water baptized or water baptized Holy Spirit, but you need all three. And so there's many stories about these baptisms uh, in the scripture. And for time's sake, let me just give you one that's all three, you see all three happening here. So Acts 8, five through seven. Are you guys okay? You hanging in there with me? Okay, I gotta give you a lot of stuff. It's on your live notes. Acts 8, five through seven, verse 12 and 14 through 17. Philip went down to a city in Samaria he was church planting as well. And he proclaimed the Messiah there, proclaimed Jesus. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Don't you? You know what gets the attention of the lost people? Power of God. We need the Holy Spirit power operating in our lives. Why? Because it shows the people that are lost and hurting that there's hope and there's help for their life. The power of God through the person and working of the Holy Spirit. For, for signs, wonders, and miracles are happening here. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many. Many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. But when they believed, they believed. There's that first baptism, salvation. Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, baptized in water, both men and women. And when the apostles in Jerusalem, word got back to headquarters in Jerusalem, they had heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. They sent the big guns, Peter and John, to Samaria. And when they arrived, what did they do? After they believed and after they were baptized or water baptized, then several days later, because who knows how long it took to get word to Jerusalem from Samaria, and then get the Paul and, and, and John or Peter there back to J J Samaria from Jerusalem. Okay, a lot of time has passed. I guess that's my point, right? They prayed for the new believers that there might, they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. It had come in them when they believed. And then they got water baptized, an outward expression of the inward work. And yet then they came to pray with them for the Holy Spirit to come on them. And they had simply been baptized in the name of Jesus our Lord. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. Do you see there's another working here? And so we just wanna settle for one because we don't understand or we think it's goofy and it's crazy, and that's sad and that's not the case. They want you to have all three. They want you to operate in the Holy Spirit power. God has a journey he wants to take you on. He wants to take you on a journey of all three, a salvation experience, a water baptism experience, and a baptism in the Holy Spirit experience. But the devil has been a master at scaring people away from something that's innocent and pure, not freaky or spooky. Keep you away from God wants to empower you with. Let's take a look at 1 John 5, seven through eight. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. Say in heaven. In heaven, the God the Father, the Word, Jesus was referred to as the Word, John 1, 1. The word came to the earth and became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus. So Father, the Father, the word, or Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, talking about the Trinity. Then it goes on to say in verse eight, and there are three that bear witness, where? On earth, are you with me? On earth, and that is the Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the water, water baptism, and the blood of the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross, 
so we could have access to the family of God or be baptized in Christ. All these three agree as one on the earth. He wants you, the Trinity, <laughs> wants you to walk in all three baptisms here on the earth. It's for everybody. All three are for everybody. This is how God set it up. Man did not set it up this way. You saw in the scripture, God set it up this way. Man has complicated it and taken it to be something I believe sometimes God never intended. So the question is, why do I need this? If I can get to heaven without the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because you're on the earth. Because <laughs> you're not in heaven yet. Guess what? You won't need this when you're in heaven. You'll be with the Father. You'll be with him in that environment. You won't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in heaven. But while you're on earth, Know this, God's designed you to live a spirit-empowered life. God has designed you to live a spirit-empowered life. God never designed his church to operate in their own natural strength and ability. He's always designed his church to be supernatural, to be powerful. He always wanted you to live with power, always wanted you to live with boldness, where signs, wonders, and miracles follow your life. Somewhere along the way, all the packaging of all this has turned people off. It's abuse and misuse of it. And hey, I don't want that stuff either. But I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit since I've been 12. And I pray in that heavenly language, we'll talk about it in a minute, every day, every day I do that. And it's a beautiful thing. It's just something the enemy has twisted with the packaging of it all. But God's designed you to live a spirit-empowered life, not under your own ability. He wants to empower you. Why? Because he's given you a job. He's given you a mission to go change the world and we can't do it in our own power. We can't do it in our own ability. We need signs, wonders, and miracles to confirm his word. We need power to live this life in a way that we can touch and reach the lives of other people. Okay, I get that. I see what you're saying there, Pastor. But why is it a separate experience? Why didn't he just put it all together as one? Because they're different. God did not want anything attached to your salvation experience other than what Jesus did. It's an act of grace and faith. Salvation takes care of your eternity. Baptism in the Holy Spirit takes care of your earth. I think I'll just be so bold as to make this statement. If what we see today, which turns people off of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if they were all packaged together in salvation, there'd be a whole lot of people that would say, you know what, I don't need to get saved. I don't want that. So it was really wonderful that God separated them and made salvation his own experience, all three of them. You won't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in eternity is for the earth. And for whatever reason, it becomes something misunderstood, abused, and feared. And honestly, there's only one part of the Holy Spirit we don't really understand, we try and stay away from, that's been talked about wrong, expressed wrong, and that is tongues or the heavenly language. And yet it's all over the New Testament. You cannot read the New Testament without reading about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. In fact, you'll see it more referred to more than you'll see salvation there. It's all over the New Testament. And let me say it this way, New Test for New Testament believers, it was a normal experience. Today, we have to teach a series. And we have to give all these disclaimers, and please come back, you know, all this kind of stuff. But back in that day, when the believers first knew Jesus Christ, salvation, it was just part of your Christian life. It's what you did. It's what God intended. Let me give you a few things on this, Acts 1-8, Acts 1-8, here we go. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. This is when the church is getting ready to be established. God's getting ready to pour out his power in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, go wait for me in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. And you'll be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Power will come when? When the Holy Spirit is poured out to do what? Be witnesses, in other words, to be bold, to be bold in your life for Jesus Christ. Goes on to say this in the next passage, Acts 2, one through four. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, 120 in the upper room. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began and speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Powers being poured out, to fulfill a mission, be witnesses, be bold in your witness and sharing Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit fell. Now all of them were in the upper room. What were they doing? They were waiting for the promise of the Father. And let me submit to you that if 120 people are waiting in a room based on specific instruction, wait there for the promise of the Father, what do you think they were talking 
about or praying for or wanting the promise of the Father. <laughs> That's why they're in the upper room. And what did God do? He gave what he promised. And the promise came into their lives. And they were empowered. And part of that empowerment was a beautiful heavenly language. In fact, go on and read from Acts on there out. It just, it just changed the world in that moment. The church was born under the power of, the church was born and established with the power of the Holy Spirit. Who are we to change it today? Amen. We're not to have a powerless Christianity. We're not to be a powerless church. And we can have the power of God with all the, without all the goofiness and spookiness and craziness. We can do that, we've done that. If you've been coming for a while, and now you're thinking, oh, we're talking about tongues, I didn't know where this was one of those churches. Guess what? You liked it up until that point in time. <laughs> Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. <laughs> I want to make one comment. No one laid hands on them. Acts 10, 44 through 46. Peter was going to, in a dream, he saw he was through the Holy Spirit, was going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. They hadn't done that yet. They didn't think the Gentiles were supposed to have it. The Jews were supposed to have it. So while Peter was still speaking these words, he was preaching to Cornelius and his whole family was gathered there. The Holy Spirit came and all who heard the message the circumcised believers who had come with Jesus and Peter were astonished, the, the Jews, and that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on even the Gentiles, those crazy Gentile people, heathens, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Well, what happened? Well, P Peter is preaching the gospel, and all of a sudden they believe in God. They get saved at some point based on what he's preaching, and then we see that they began to speak in other tongues, so we know there's a salvation experience because you can't have the speaking in tongues experience without being transformed through a salvation experience in order to receiving the Holy Spirit. So at some point in time in his preaching, they got saved and began to speak in other tongues, and that just might be the case today, by the way. I'm believing that will be. You don't need to wait till the end of service. Just jump in on your heavenly language right now. There you go. How about that? No hands were laid on them, Acts 19, 6, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. The reason why I wanted to emphasize that is, yes, you can have people lay hands on you and sometimes that's a great thing and a helpful thing or you don't need that. You see it both ways in the scripture. We make a doctrine over one thing, right? Well, you can only receive it if someone lays hands on you. Well, I mean, we just showed you two places. That's not the case. And so we need to understand that, and I'll explain that, it's a gift and you just ask for it. 1 Corinthians 14, 18 through 19. I thank God. This is the Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, probably did more for the kingdom in the New Testament anyways than anybody else. And here's what he said. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Another translation says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than y'all because he was from South Israel. Okay. <laughs> he wrote the things that we live by today. I just don't know about that tongues thing. I don't, I don't want anything to do. Are you kidding me? Well, then you're living your life by things that tongue-talking man wrote. And how do you think it came to him? Through the Holy Spirit? So we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. There's a man that we all aspire. Follow me as I follow Christ, he says. And then, then he's given us instruction for life. And he's the guy that says, I thank God that I speak more in, in tongues and more than y'all. I can't imagine not living. Why did he able, why was he unable to do it? Plant all the churches, raise up all the leaders and, and, and write two thirds of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit empowered him to do that? Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 18 through 19, we we'll keep going. But in the church, listen, no, hold on. But in the church, listen, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Why? Because people think it's crazy. So the problem we have really is the gifts. I don't have time to go back two weeks ago. We talked about the gifts. One of the gifts is gift of speaking in tongues. Another gift is interpretation. The Bible says you don't have one without the other operating. So we see sometimes in churches and places, someone a give a tongue and, and something like that, and we think that that's just weird, goofy. That is a gift as the Holy Spirit leads. I know many times it's not been Holy Spirit led. But Paul's talking about here, not about that gift. He's talking about the grace gift that every believer can have of having a heavenly language. A heavenly language. That he says, I, I pray it all the time. He says, and it, and we see and we, we, we judge something by what we've seen as abuse, some outward expression that you can't even sometimes find in the scripture. Let's keep going. First Corinthians 14, four. Listen to this. 
Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. Why, why do I need this tongue thing? Because it builds you up. You're having a hard day, guess what you should do? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna call my spouse, I'm gonna call my friend, I'm gonna call my pastor. Don't call your pastor. I'm gonna call, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's praying the Holy Spirit. You don't have to make a big scene at work. You don't have to make a big scene where you are. Man, what's that guy doing? What are you doing? I'm just edifying myself, right? Well, you're freaking me out, dude. I don't know what that is. It builds you up. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't need that? Okay, every day. I mean, I think I've prayed in tongues more recently than I've prayed in my life. I I needed to be edified. I needed needed to build myself up because this world was sucking life out of me. Things weren't working out the way I'd hoped. It was hurtful. I just prayed in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let's take another look at another one. Uh, what's the next one? Okay, Jude 20. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you that there's times when I feel like my faith is weak? What do I do in those moments? I pray in the Holy Spirit. I just can't, I can't go on. I, I, I don't know how this is gonna happen. I don't know if I have the faith to believe this. You know what the Bible says? And pray in your heavenly language. You can pray quietly to yourself. No one even has to hear you pray. And that's because it's not for them. It's not for them. It's for you. It's to build you up and edify you. It's to build your faith when your faith has grown weak. Acts 1.8, but you'll receive power. We've gone over this one. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. You'll be bold. I just wish I, just wish I was more bold. I, I wish I had the courage to go do this or talk to them, do that. Guess what happens when you, when you receive your heaven language and you pray in the Holy Spirit? Boldness rises up in you. Boldness. You know what happened with Peter? Peter denied Jesus three times in the face of a little elementary age girl. He was afraid when she pointed him out as one of the Christ followers. But then all of a sudden, 50 days later, after Jesus is resurrected and breathed on Peter, received uh, salvation experience, Holy Spirit, and he was in the upper room and the power of God fell. He comes out in the street, preaches the gospel. 3,000 people get saved. He couldn't even stand up to one elementary girl. What's the only thing that changed in that time span? He received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and he led 3,000 people to Christ in one day. It'll give you power, boldness. It doesn't make you some crazy fanatic. Well, I just don't want like an H-E-B. I don't want that to come on me. I don't want that to come on you in H-E-B either. And if it does, please don't be wearing your Tree of Life merch. <laughs> don't grab that little speaker at the cash register and you know, all that kind of stuff. The Holy Spirit's not gonna make you do that. He's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. He's not doing that. It's interesting the things that we believe. Romans 8, 26 through 27. In the same way, listen to this. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, heavenly language. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people, listen to this, in accordance with the will of God. I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to pray, what do I do? I pray in my heavenly language. What does the Bible says? Then my spirit connects with the Spirit of God who knows all things, and then when I'm praying in the Holy Spirit, it says I'm praying in accordance with the will of God, or I'm praying the perfect prayer. The perfect prayer. What happens when I'm praying in my heavenly language? You're freaking everybody else out. No, it's not for everybody else. But I'm praying the perfect prayer. Can I tell you? There's situations you just don't even know what to pray. I just, I just don't even know what to pray. I, I, I don't, my mind, my emotions are so consumed or crazy or chaotic, I don't even know what to pray. I just have to pray in the Holy Spirit. And guess what? When you do, you pray the prayer according to the will of God because your spirit is connected with God's spirit. And God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, knows everything because he's God. And so you pray the perfect prayer in accordance with the will of God. Let me give you another one. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15. I think we've done this one already. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. And we haven't done this one yet. If I pray in a tongue, heavenly language, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. And there's the rub, right? My mind doesn't understand it. Your mind doesn't want anything happening in you that you do not understand. It's the enemy of it. So what shall I do? I'll pray with my spirit, but I'll also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I'll also sing with my understanding. Hey, do both. Your mind's giving you a hard time, that just doesn't make sense, I'm just not into that, you know, whatever. Pray in your understanding, pray what you know to pray, and then when you don't know what to pray anymore, switch over and start praying in your heavenly language. It's a benefit. 
It's a benefit. It's not some weird, goofy, spooky, crazy thing. It's a benefit for everybody. Let me, let me tell you my story real quick. Uh, my dad got rededicated. He, when he was in Vietnam, my dad, he had got saved as a kid, but when he was in Vietnam, two tours, combat tours, he said, God, if you bring me home alive, I will serve you all the days of my life. Battlefield prayer. He gets home, he forgets about his prayer. <laughs> he gets caught up like all the Vietnam vets and come home to a very difficult time and alcohol and drugs and just rejection, has a hard time. Well, a guy at work, where he works, was just sharing the gospel with him all the time, sharing the gospel with him. And finally, it just grabbed my dad's heart and he rededicated his life. And when he rededicated his life, everything changed for the Duncan family. And so all of a sudden now, he takes us all to the, he knew that where we, what he was doing, where we were going, just wasn't enough. There had to be more to life. He needed more to life. So he took us to this Holy Roller Church, Pentecostal on Fire, Holy Ghost, Holy Roller Church. All the things that scare you were happening there that day. That's my first exposure to it, by the way, at 12 years old. My brother, my sister, and I, my mom and dad walk in. They're ministering the gospel, and at the end, they just give a call for anybody that wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That now is the last thing I want to do. <laughs> and my sister raises her hand, and so my dad looks down the row and says, okay, all of you go up there. And my brother and I are like, no, I didn't raise my hand. I'm like, uh-uh, I didn't. That was Amy. Go on, Amy. Come on, go ahead, Amy. Go on, just be brave. Go on, you can go up there. My dad forced all three of us up there. My brother's 14, I'm 12, my sister's 10. We go up front and they pray over us and send us back to the back room, which is always a little scary. What are they gonna do with us back there in the back room? My brother's like, just don't drink any Kool-Aid. I don't know, okay, I'm all right. All right no, listen. So we go in the back room and they explain the Holy Spirit and they start praying for all of us. And I'm just like, okay, and I just, I can't, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm just standing there. I don't know what's going through my 12-year-old mind and the craziness of what I just saw, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, they stop, the person stops praying for me and they go get the pastor's wife. And I'm like, oh man, okay, let's see what you got, lady. No, I'm just kidding, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so she prays with me and then she tells me, she says, I didn't, my heavenly language didn't come out or whatever and I, and I was like, well, I don't know, I guess I didn't get it. And she goes, no, you got it, you got it, you'll get it. Just believe you got it, you asked for it, you got it. And just, you know, take some time, pray it out. So we go to someone's house for lunch that day. We're riding in the car with uh, the couple, the man and his wife. And they saw us go up, they saw us go in the back room, they might have been in the back room, and they just wanted Jeff and I to ride with them um, on the way there, so my parents allowed that. <laughs> How could you let us go? Anyway, so, are we gonna show up somewhere? And so they get us in the car, and the guy goes, hey, I saw you guys get prayed for for the Holy Spirit, how'd you do? We're like, well, you know, and he's like, okay, well, let's just pray right now. And so he starts, he goes, I'm gonna pray first, then my wife's gonna do it, and then Jeff, you're next, and then me, and I think, thank God I'm last. Maybe we'll arrive at the house or, or something. And so he starts praying in the Holy Spirit in his heavenly language, his, then his wife does that, and I'm like, don't do it, Jeff, don't do it, don't do it, Jeff, don't do it, Jeff, don't do it. And Jeff starts praying in the Holy Spirit, and I'm like, oh. and I'm just like, and I'm in this moment of like, okay, what do I do, what do I do? I'm like, okay, God, if this is real, and I have no reason to believe that it's not, then I want everything you have. I just want it all. I mean, help me, help me. I want it all. And then I just open my mouth, and in faith just started, and my heavenly language came. Now it was just a few words, I don't know if, I, if you'll understand, it's just a few words, but over the years, and now I'm 53, and I thank God for that moment and that backseat of that car. I thank God every day for that. Not a day, not a day goes by that I don't, I don't use my heavenly language. It is a beautiful thing between God and myself. It's not for anybody else, and I don't care what anybody else thinks. It's not for you anyways. It's for me and God, and for you and God. And I just wanna encourage you in that this morning. I thank God. And, I, and it's not weird, and it's not spooky. It's a beautiful prayer language. And I, and I remember at first initially, because we're still going to that church and stuff like that, and, I, and I'm praying the Holy Spirit at home, and I'm trying to grow and develop that, that language within me as my faith grows, my, that, that grows, if you will. And, and I remember going in times in the meetings, though, and I'm just like, okay, Holy Spirit, behave. We're not running the aisle, I'm not holy rolling, I'm not rolling around the floor, I'm not, you know, doing all that. And he's like, I'm not either. <laughs> but I want everything God has. Come on, somebody. I want everything God has. Doesn't have to have all that. Let me say, there's more. There's more. We want to be a church that has power without being weird. We want to be a place that fully embraces the person, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit. We want to be a place full of the Holy Spirit without all the packaging that turns us all off. We want to be a powerful, not weird place where God works and changes lives, and that's not weird. I'm not weird. 
Why do you laugh at that one? Eh? Ushers. I'm just kidding. It's not weird. But let's not miss out on the Holy Ghost power to do what God's called us to do. My deepest prayer is for you is that you don't resist the Holy Spirit because every good and perfect gift, the Bible says, comes down from above. The Holy Spirit's a gift from God and it will be beyond what your mind can contain. I wanna read another scripture and then I gotta close this. I didn't put this in your notes. It was just rolling around in me and then this morning I came to church and I said, I need to add this so it'll be on the screen for you. You can always go back and watch this again and I recommend especially this one. First Corinthians 2, nine through 14. Our mind gets in the way. The Holy Spirit's a gift from God and he will work beyond what your mind can contain. First Corinthians 2, 9 through 14 says this, however, as it is written, no eye has seen what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God's prepared for those who love him. You can't understand God. He's too big. And if you wanna understand him before you do anything, you'll never do anything. He'll never come down to the size of your brain. And if you're serving a God the size of your brain, he's too small. He's more than what you can imagine or hope or think. These are the things God's revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we've received is not of the, is, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak. Not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. Our Spirit in connection with God's Spirit. Our natural mind cannot comprehend, so we gotta be able to block that out and just in faith trust God and connect Spirit to Spirit. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. Why are we listening to people without the Spirit tell us that the Holy Spirit is foolishness? They cannot comprehend it. They can't understand the Spirit of God. The Spirit of the, don't worry about the Spirit of this world. It can't kind of understand the Spirit of God. That's why this world needs the church to walk in the person, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit. That's what this is about. Many people pass up divine encounters because they're satisfied with what their mind can understand. God's bigger and there's more. I love to speak in my heavenly language. Do I have to speak in tongues? No, you don't have to. You get to, you get to. It's a wonderful benefit. Here we do, number one, remove all barriers. How do I do this? You remove all barriers. Some have doctrinal barriers. Some have been bad experiences, or seen bad experiences. Some have been told, it's been taught from pulpits. I don't get it, I see it in the Bible. It's been told by people that it's not right, it's not for today. Some have doctrinal barriers, you need to remove those, wipe the slate clean. Some have been taught that things aren't for today. That's not true. Some of us have seen and heard goofy, crazy things. There's things that are happening, people will say the Holy Spirit, I don't find it in the scripture. I don't find it there. You see the Holy Spirit all throughout the Bible. It was a normal experience for the New Testament church. Acts 2, 38 through 39. Peter replied and said, remove all barriers. Peter replied and said, repent. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I didn't know. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all those who are far off. Well, it was only for them on Bible day. No, no, no. It was for the children, children's children, children's children, children's children, children's children, all those who are far off, which ultimately leads to you and I and all those to come after us. It's for every believer, the Holy Spirit. Number two, request the gift of the Holy Spirit. Request the gift. Is it that simple, Pastor? Yes, just ask. People gathered in the upper room waiting on the promise that Jesus said would come. They just asked. You just ask. It's a free gift. It's that easy. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says this, if you then, though you are, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? How much more would your heavenly Father give you the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit if you just ask? You can, anything from God is good and good for you. You don't have to be afraid of anything from God. It's a good gift. 
The job God has given you, given us, we need the Holy Spirit empowerment. He says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And number three, receive him by faith. Receive him by faith. You don't understand, I, you know what? I didn't understand everything about salvation. But guess what? I am saved and going to heaven. Do you see God? I do not. But I believe he's true and I am saved and going to heaven. It's the same thing. You want the Holy Spirit? You ask him by faith. I don't understand all there is and I don't either and I've been doing this for a long time. I don't understand it all. But I see it in the scripture and I see that it's what you want for your people and I want all that you have for me. So you take that step of faith. You take that step of faith. Receive the Holy Spirit. Most everything God has for you is gonna require you to take a step to get it. He's trying to bring you to a place outside what you already know and what you already have. He wants to take you beyond you to him to go from the natural to the supernatural. Your natural can't be able to figure it out. Your mind's gonna try and block it. It doesn't make sense. I don't understand. This is weird. This is crazy. But who wants to serve a God that's the size of our brain and understanding? Hebrews eleven six says, without, God, without faith it is impossible to please God. He rewards those who diligently seek him. A couple weeks, drivers, you can come out. A couple weeks, oh, I'm sorry, Holy Spirit, you can come out. <laughs> I use this with all the gifts, and you understand that then. And lots of benefits and access too. But here's what I want you to know today. He's always been there. Jesus is your Savior and Lord. He's always been on the other side of the door of your heart, gently knocking. He so desperately wants to come in and clothe you, immerse you, baptize you with power so you can live a victorious life, but so you can have impact on this earth. All you have to do today, and we'll give you in just a moment, all you have to do today, come on in. I've been waiting for you. I've been wanting to have you. Okay, okay, yeah, that's, okay, I gotta breathe. That's a big embrace there. Uh, no, don't go out, don't go out, I just invited you in. Um, just invite him in. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know. I know what that looked like for me, my family. Just so not weird, not goofy, not spooky, not demonstrative, and something's gonna happen, and you're gonna run around the room. Not any of that. No, you just invite the Holy Spirit in. You ask him to come in, and then you just start talking to him. You're real, I want you. I want you in my life. I want you in my house. I want you in my marriage. I want you in my family. I want you in my job. I want you in everything I do. I want you to be a part of my life. I want everything you have for me. I don't know what that looks like for you. Thank you, Jarvis. I don't know. But you can figure that out. My prayer for you is 2 Corinthians 13, 14, message paraphrase. The amazing grace, I pray that the amazing grace of the master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, I know this is probably hard for some of you, and I get it. There's just been a lot of stuff going on in the world. I just wanna ask you, just take that step. Open the door and invite a man. But here's what I want you to know this morning, the most important thing, because here's what I've seen over years too, is people that have that infilling, that baptism of the Holy Spirit somehow, which is a turnoff to it, somehow feel more spiritual than everybody else. Well, I, I have the Holy Spirit, so I mean, there's this arrogance sometimes I think we need to be mindful of, and that's a turnoff. It doesn't make you a first-class Christian and everybody else a second-class Christian. It doesn't do that. It doesn't make anybody less spiritual, less loving God, less saved if someone has the Holy Spirit, and they don't, it doesn't. In fact, the Bible talks about, talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, it says, if I, even though I can speak with the tongue of men and angels and I have faith to move mountains, if I have not love, then all I am is a banging gong and clashing cymbals. So I don't care if you can speak in tongues with the best of them. If you don't have love and you don't have humility in the right heart, all you are is noise. That's all you are. You're not any better, any worse than anybody else. You're just noise. So you have to decide the other side of that. If you don't believe that this is for you, you don't believe it's true, it's right, it's real, man, that's, that's your deal. As for me in my house, but that's your deal. But it doesn't make anybody else a crazy, wild-eyed, 
I jump in pews, run around the church fanatic. It doesn't. It doesn't make us wrong, you right. It doesn't do that. And so when we get to that point, you're just crazy, you're just, you don't know, that's not really in scripture, that's for them, that's all man-made and stuff. You know what that is? That's noise. That's just noise. Where have we gotten to that point in our world today? That people feel the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues think people that aren't are less spiritual than them or people that don't do it, don't believe in it, think that people are, are just some crazy wild out fanatics. All that's a bunch of noise. The difference is love. None of that matters if we aren't people of love. None of that makes a difference in this world if we're not people of love. It doesn't matter if you can speak in tongues to your neighbor if you don't walk in love. It doesn't matter if you can speak in tongues and use and operate all the gifts of the Spirit with the person at work next to you, unless you're a person of love. None of that matters. So the most important thing this morning, every day of our life, is just be the people of love. And then walk out what you believe. Open the door and let the Holy Spirit come in. Embrace him. Walk out of life with him. 